imagine that you just bought the perfect piece of land in your favorite place in the world. You are working with a designer to create an amazing home to host all your friends and family. You talk about the experience you want to have and the experience you want your guests to feel when they are at your house. We have complete control of the space. Many of us will not have the luxury of being able to have complete control over our housing situation or building that incredible house. But something we all have in control is our website. The website is a piece of digital real estate that your business owns. Unfortunately, many people don't know how to design an incredible experience that will make people want to stay at your party for a long time. Having a nicely designed website without great writing or search engine optimization is like having a beautiful home with no plumbing or sewage. There are many websites that look good but don't function well for the user. Is your online home a fixer-upper or is your online piece of real estate luxurious for everyone? Welcome to episode 11 of How to Build an Audience. I'm your host, Matthew Gutosi. How to Build an Audience is a part of Gutosi Collective, which is a personal content creation team to many businesses. We create photos and videos for your social media. Heck, we even do social media for you. This podcast show will help you grow your business and brand with marketing by interviewing top entrepreneurs and marketers who have proven to build an audience around their businesses and brands. Today, I am talking with David Riggs. David is the founder of Numa Media. He has built a great clientele, building an audience on LinkedIn and beyond. David was in college at Wabash College and wanted to help a few local businesses with their online marketing. From there, David found that he was building a lot of traffic online through social media, but nothing was converting on the websites. David focused on website development and Numa Media was born. What started as a few small jobs turned out to be the start of a business. In this episode, we will discuss how David got into website design and starting his business. We will talk about free work versus paid work. David talks about building a network online and offline to build a clientele for a business. We also discuss the power of websites for businesses. I would love to hear what you think as you are listening to the podcast. So reach out to me, Matthew Gutosi, on LinkedIn or Twitter, and we can talk there. Now, let's talk to David. When I really got like the entrepreneurial bug, right? So sophomore year in college, really wanted to start building something, didn't know what I wanted to build. And uh, ironically enough, my dad comes to me and was like, hey, I, I want a Facebook page. Um, so my dad's in public policy. He's very forward, kind of public facing. And he's like, you know, everyone else has a Facebook page. I'm going to get a Facebook page supposed to it. Let's make it happen. So at this point, I don't even know if I had a Facebook account. Um, I wasn't really a big social media user. Truthfully, I'm still not. But I was like, you know, I can figure out a Facebook. Like I, I can do that. So dove into it, figured out the Facebook page, kind of fell in love with the fact that it's like a really easy way to communicate with people, right? It's one, like it opens up doors that you wouldn't normally have. Like when, when can you actually press a button and go talk to thousands of people with ease? And two, it's like the science and the art of actually building an audience and understanding like the give and take there. Um, so that got me started into just like the world of entrepreneurship. I, I tried managing social media accounts for a while. It went okay, but it's a ton of work there's just so much that goes on. Social media managers are the most under-respected people out there because they got like 37 different things going on at all times and they're expected to just manage all of it perfectly. Um, but quickly ran out of steam on that. It was fun, taught me a lot, uh, kind of backed out and moved more to this project style of just doing web websites. Um, and the thing that I noticed is we were, you know, create a lot of demand, get a lot of interest through the social media accounts but we couldn't really point it anywhere because a lot of these companies either didn't have a website or their website wasn't really optimized to start getting more traffic. It was more of like that info site that just sat there. So I was like, you know, let's just take a step deeper and, you know, I guess no longer the tip of the iceberg. Let's really dive down into it. Like how can we actually structure and change the business with the website in mind to really like optimize it and grow the business. So the tagline now is developing websites that develop your business um, really landed on that skill set. One, like I said, I wanted to get into the heart of the business. Social is really something that you can tack on top of the right business and really scale it. But I was, I have more fun getting into the systems and the operations of the business, understanding it, and then building a website that actually works for that model. Um, so got into that partly because of the project, but partly because I, I enjoy the business side of things. Um, 
but yeah, I really got into website building. The social media stuff was fun, but didn't really fit the style of work that I wanted to do. Um, and that's the fun of being an entrepreneur. You pivot, you figure it out, uh, and then you move forward, right? So uh, yeah, that's a little background on really where and how I got into the website building. Um, I think the fun of that skill especially is it touches a lot of different skill sets, right? You think of yeah. website development, you know, you can throw it up on WordPress, you can throw it up on Squarespace, Wix, Webflow, Weebly. And there's like a hundred different platforms you can build. But like doing it well, understanding the copywriting, understanding the SEO, understanding like, you know, conversion tracks and how people actually use that website and that, you know, a website that looks really fancy and cool may not actually be the best one for the business. And really seeing that full picture, it's fun. I think it has taught me much more about psychology than, than I would have thought, which is uh I, it's a regret now that I didn't do something more with psychology in college. To start any pursuit, something needs to inspire us to take action. I wanted to know what lit the entrepreneurial flame inside David at a young age. Yeah, this is, uh, we'll, I guess we'll go off brand on this one. Um, so obviously, I, I'm a college student. I, if you follow me on social, I can be outspoken and pretty harsh on formal education. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I was kind of fed up with just going to class and learning from a textbook that was 20 years old and no one could really tell me why I was learning it. And I know that's like the very cliche answer, right? Like all, all fed up students say that, but at the end of the day, you know, I was like, I don't mind the learning side of things. I just want to know what I'm learning is actually going to be useful. But I mean, selfishly, we all got to make money to actually move forward. Like to say, just go chase your, you know, your hopes and dreams and money will come later. Isn't always the greatest strategy. Like you want to go to college to get those skill sets you can actually leverage for a higher income. So I'm sitting here like, you know, I haven't really learned any high leverage skill set. Like, it, you know, nothing here is actually clicking. I can't go run up to an employer and be like, hey, look at this paper I wrote. Um, and I guess I'm being harsh, but at the heart of it, it was like I was kind of getting fed up. It's just the fact that I didn't see how what I was learning was supposed to connect to the real world in any way. So I was like, I'm just going to go do it on my own. Uh, and me being, you know, a, a stubborn, like into freshman going into sophomore year was probably a bit overconfident, probably hit way too many roadblocks that I should have. I could have just asked someone for some help. But um, yeah, I really got into it in the fact that I was just getting a little fed up, a little tired. Like I wanted to have my hands on what I was learning, but really understand the why, like behind what I was learning. Um, you know, why, why do I want to dive into marketing? Why do I want to dive into, you know, business development and business growth? Um, really just got it because I was ready to kind of take that next step and be like, you know, classrooms are cool. You can learn some stuff in there, but like, you know, the best way to learn is to actually go and do it. So I really just started seeking out experiences and it just compounded and built a lot of momentum. So you build a high level skill like website building, even content creation, social media. Why build your own business, not just work for somebody else? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I still kind of fight with that and tackle with that day by day, trying to figure out where I fall on that. Um, I'm not one to say, you know, every nine to five is evil and you should never do it because at the end of the day, you know, an entrepreneur builds out a team because working with a team is fun. You know, there are plenty of teams out there that are awesome to work with and you can dive into them, right? Um, I think part of the reason why I love the more entrepreneurial side of things is because you can control the pace and in that you can make things really, really fast if you want, uh, which is the fun of it. Um, but I think... I guess really looking at that, I, I enjoy the entrepreneurial side just because you get to own the full picture. Um, you know, you really get to decide where the business goes, especially if you're sitting at the top or towards the top. You get a lot of that decision making and leeway. But at the same page, I mean, there's no better way for a college student or someone younger right out of college to get experience than, you know, sitting down with a laptop for 60 hours a week, hopefully not forever, but right at the beginning, get your ducks in a row and actually try to go figure it out on your own. You obviously helped your dad with, you know, the Facebook page. How do you actually get your first few clients? How do you start building up? Is it connections that, you know, maybe through your dad? Was it a businesses? Did you even know your target audience? Yeah, my target audience was anyone who would pay me. <laughs> uh, that, didn't, that didn't last very long, but it was definitely that at the, at the front. But um, ironically, I wanted to make that switch to websites, right? And my first client was myself. I built myself a portfolio site, put some stuff on there and basically took it to clients. It was like, look, you know, I can, I got the website. It looks pretty like, you know, I can do the same thing for you. Uh, and it really started out with like a, a one man show in that regard. I think one of the first real clients per se that I guess wasn't myself 
um, was a good friend of mine. Uh, he has an awesome, amazing story. His name's Will Yank. Uh, I was during finals week, nonetheless, and I texted him. I was like, hey, you know, I, I want to build websites and I think you'd be the person, perfect person to build a website for it. Just like, let, let me build it for free. Let me throw some stuff up there. Let me get stuff organized and going. Like, I just want to see if this would even be a fun thing to pursue. Uh, so he's my first actual client, built it for him, basically took those two sites, pitched my next uh, next client, and he's been a huge source of referral business for us. Um, and it just kind of gone th- gone on like that. Started starting in the process, getting more active on LinkedIn, but that first client was really just a, a good mix of luck, but just, you know, not rewriting the rule book, but just understanding like the intricacies of the game you're playing and that no one said you couldn't build yourself a website and use that as your own client. There is an ongoing debate about when you should do free work versus paid work and if that's even ever appropriate. I have my own opinions, but I wanted to know why David did free work and when you should or should not do it. Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, my my thoughts on this have changed multiple times. I think I'm at a point to where if I listen to this in like six months, it'll probably be the same. Um, coming down to it, I think free work is great if you are brand new in the space, right? If you are someone who wants to maybe do app development, website development. Um, you know, you want to do more of like the larger demand gen content writing for some company. Go, you know, go on doors and get a bunch of experience and get free experience, but go in, in the sense that you're not just trying to walk in there, you know, type at your computer, get it done and send it off and be like, okay, cool, free work, I'm qualified now. Like use that first one as a stepping stone to understand systems, to understand client relationship. Like you should know before you do free work what you want to get out of that exchange. It shouldn't be like, hey, you know, at your knees begging for free work. Like you should know exactly what you're getting out of that. And it may not be monetary, but you should get value. You should be able to understand, you know, this is a system of how I contact clients and stay in touch with them. This is the, honestly, let's get down to like, am I going to use Google Drive or Dropbox? Am I going to use Word or Google Docs? Like really dive into like what questions you want answered at each of these actual clients can give you. And then if you can go in there and find one of those clients that, you know, wow, this client would give me answers to nine out of these 10 things. It's free. You know, I'm early on. This is a great way to go for it. But um, don't do free work for the sake of doing free work. Like you don't have to suffer that long. There are plenty of people out there that that will and can pay you. I think that's whenever we talk about like, when is free work bad? You know, you have the systems underneath your belt. You have an idea of how to do it. Let's say you have one to two clients underneath your belt and both of them give you positive testimonials. Instead of doing free work, just go for a heavy discount. You know, hey, this is what I would price it in six months if I kept on this route. Let's say an ebook's five hundred dollars. Let's go to a client and be like, all right, two fifty for an ebook. Just you know, heavily discounted. Instead of going free, just go slash slash your price and see what it looks like. But I think too many people. This is me kind of ranting, kind of you know, romanticize this idea of free work, like the the hustle, right? And it's great, but it's great to an extent. Um, you know, until like once you get the experience and once you build the momentum charge for that. Like you've put in time and money, you you've earned the value of going out and actually pricing your stuff diligently. Um, so that's where I think I right off the top to get the ball rolling. Free work is great. I mean, if you have the time, the energy and the persistence to go out and do a couple free jobs, do it. But once you get the ball rolling, the quickest way to get it rolling faster and for it to roll longer is to put some money behind it. I love how you see free work as a way to structure your business and you have to be intentional with what you're getting out of it to find really real good value, more than just a portfolio piece, but really to build out your own systems. I mean, to give you an example, we just finished up a free work client because it's a it's a new market, it's a new system, it's a new operational side of things. And I mean, we're year two now, year two or three, the website side of stuff, uh, did it completely free. And I mean, we, we don't, we didn't have to, we probably could have pitched, but it was like a really good way for us to get in the door, mostly because this is a market that no one really wants to focus on. So I was like, you know, let's take a shot. At this point, can we figure it out? Can we not? Can we really be intentional about what we want to get from that exchange? Um, But I guess lack of a better term, right? And you said it perfectly. Don't go into one of those free work exchanges just wanting to do the work and hoping to get lucky that they're going to refer you. Like be super intentional about what you want to get out of it. And even to the point that you make that known to the client. Like, hey, I know this is free work. These are the things that I'm looking to answer for my business. So even if you want to give me insider feedback around these areas, that would be really helpful. So even having like a good survey to help you even build out that experience and make it more valuable, more than just your own, you know, perspective of it, but also getting their perspective on your new systems or whatever you're trying to build out. I love that. So with with free work, 
on the same way content is free. So what's your perspective on putting out content and building a personal brand? Why create all this free work when you've got all this valuable knowledge, you charge clients for it? Why would you put out free content and how does that affect your audience and your business? So I think let's flash back 20 or 30 years to what businesses look like. Then it was more or less, you know, do people know who you are? Do they trust you? And do you want to buy, right? I think nowadays people mistake it and try and make it super complicated. At the end of the day, I think if someone knows who you are, they can trust you and know that you're talented, they're going to hire you. And this is where it comes back to, I think, you know, you hop on LinkedIn, there's a lot of SDRs and salespeople there, which is fine. And they give really good advice, honestly. But at the end of the day, I'm not as focused on selling as I am focused on being the consultant in your corner. So my content, you know, I want it to feel like you're getting a daily blast or a every other day blast from like, you know, the CMO in your back pocket, the marketing team in your corner. Like I should just be feeding you consistent advice because um, if you ever see the sales triangle, you know, most people are sitting that 60 ish range right in the middle to where, you know, they know they have a problem. They're not ready to pay for it. They'll pay for it in the future when the time's right. Very few people are sitting up at this top part that like, I need to, I need to get a new website by the end of the week. And I think too many people really heavily focus on that top two or 3% and not enough people focus on that middle 60%. So when you're looking at a sales strategy, it's like, you know, how much can you tailor your content to the long-term game? Sure. I can put up a post. Honestly, I could probably put up a post tonight and be like, Hey, you know, first person to DM me gets 25% off a new website. There's a chance that we could pick up a client or, you know, the thing is I could sit there and actually build into the 60%, you know, the middle of the sales triangle, really hone in, give them everything they need. And in terms of that, like we're talking about, you know, why put it out there for free? Well, one, it builds trust. You know, these people are going to see my post 60, 70, 80 times in their feed before they make a decision. By the time they contact me, not only do they feel like they know me, but they know my strategy, they know my structure, they know how I work about projects, they know my thought process, my ideals about how to go about a website. There, there aren't any surprises. It's an easy choice for them that as soon as they need that new website, they're like, oh yeah, that David dude keeps posting about websites. You know, he has the nice videos and carousels uh, all in. I'm going to DM him right now. And, uh, and like, it seems weird, but it happens like that. And our deal cycles are like 24 hours through LinkedIn, 12 hours through LinkedIn, because people are like, Hey, you know, I've seen your stuff forever. I know, I know that what you can do, how you do it. Let's get a proposal over, see what it looks like and go from there. Um, so part of the reason, you know, you give it away for free. People know, you know, let's say they know I build websites, but people want to see under the hood and see more or less like, okay, does he really know what he's talking about? Yep. He does. Here's the whole, like he could give away the whole book on writing a website. People don't really care. People just want to pay you for the implementation. That's always been my strategy. That's why, you know, my thought process behind actually posting all that content. Um, you, you just want to consult. You don't want to sell. Um, there's no need to go out there and pitch everybody. They're going to come to you anyway. It's better to just continually add value, build the trust, give it away for free because really people are going to pay you for implementation. They're not going to build you for the answers because Google kind of changed that or at least implemented that for the long run. Google, you can find any answer that you want, but Google's not going to build you a website. You're going to have to go find someone to do that. After the break, David talks about how working with TEDx built his network. This show is sponsored by Gatozic Collective. We are a marketing agency based in Austin, Texas that is a personal marketing team to many businesses. We create photo and video content delivered to you each month to save you time and a massive headache when you're planning your social media for the month. If planning's too much for you, we can also run your social media accounts to give you more time to grow your business. You can visit our website at www.gatozicollective.com. Now, let's get back to the show. Online networks are great, but knowing people in person from different experiences is powerful. David worked with TEDx while he was at Wabash College. TEDx brings in amazing speakers from around the world who get to share their ideas to an audience. I wanted to know how TEDx helped David in his business later on in life. Man, that is a fantastic question. Um, So looking back at TEDx, it's one of those things that I put up online. I think people know at least the, the people close to me or have been following me for a while connected with me know me as like the TEDx guy now, which is fun. I don't do it anymore. Um, you know, I, I still got the business cards laying around. Um, but I think the fun of it 
is TEDx was one of those things that was an easy sell. It'd be like, you know, go into somebody who needs new shoes and having a brand new pair of Nikes for $10. Like, of course, they're going to like, it was such an easy thing to go forward with. And I think at the stage of kind of like me being an entrepreneur and where I was, TEDx was really beneficial because it built up a lot of confidence in the sense of, you know, can I actually run something and run it well? Um, I mean, there was a team of about 20 to 30 people at all times. It's a lot to like manage and go through, especially as a student. Um, but the main, the other thing is, which is fun, it's the, the client relationship side of that stuff. So to give you a background into TEDx, you know, we bring eight to 10 speakers a year. I guess we, they, uh, we used to, whenever I was a part of it, brought eight to 10 speakers uh, to this event every year. Like we're talking directors of marketings, you know, people who work directly with VC firms that raise a ton of money, New York Times bestselling authors, Pulitzer Prize winners. Like these are legit people. And here you are as a 20, 21, 22 year old coaching them on how to do their talk or, you know, coaching them on stage presence. And it's awesome because it builds up a lot of confidence, but it also reminds you that each and every one of us has something unique to actually share that I quite literally can help a Pulitzer Prize winner tailor her talk to make sure that it's actually good to go across the stage. Um, I think TEDx, any type of event, any type of speaking event, but the more you can get involved in that fun stuff that is low risk, high reward that you work with a team, super beneficial for anyone, super beneficial for me though, because it, it gave me the confidence and really helped me get that ball rolling, but reminded me to actually think bigger that, you know, why not go ahead and shoot for the stars, so to speak, not to be cliche and really go after, you know, a bigger client that, at the end of the day, they're probably having the same problems that one of your smaller clients is having as well. The main thing you're just worried about is how big their logo seems. Um, so I, I think TEDx definitely reminded me that like, look, you know, across the board, there's going to be people that you can help top of the line to bottom of the line. It's up to you where you want to go and who you want to help and how you want to go about that. Taking experiences that give us confidence, it helps us to then take those bigger jumps because we just did one that seemed daunting and i love how you even thought about you know you were 20 30 people if you can run this maybe you can run your own business or run a business that's got five employees um and so that's a really cool way to way to think of it how as your network has grown your personal brand is a lot bigger linkedin is starting to take off and all this stuff you're meeting a lot of people online maybe you've met some of them in person how does meeting people that aren't your target audience, like other marketers, other website builders, how does that actually help build an audience and authority around what you talk about and actually attract potential customers to your business? I'll give you a, like a real example. There's a close friend of mine named Jason Vanna. Um, him and I have done some work together in the past, but you know, on the surface, we look like competitors. One does a branding agency, one does more of the website design development agency. But the fact that we're close, we're consistently trading like, you know, tips and tricks about how to go about LinkedIn, prospecting, client relationships. We were talking about new softwares to use last night or last night, last week. Um, you know, understanding that, you know, how to make friends with like the people that aren't in your target audience is really good because, you know, I'm not going to go out and build a logo for a client because I'm horrible at it. But, you know, Jason builds logos and Jason and I are friends. So Jason's already won me over that client's going straight over to Jason. In the same way, you know, if a website comes through on Jason's door, he doesn't want to do a website. Well, a good thing he knows me because he can send the website my way. So I think people really, you know, and this is my thing about LinkedIn, especially, but really just business across the board is we get really competitive that, you know, our competition is right next door and we got to take everything for ourselves it's a lot easier to, you know, hone in on what you're good at, but really build relationships and be tactical with it. You know, I'm going to go talk to like this branding agency or this content creation agency, or, you know, the people that potentially may need my services, because at the end of the day, it looks a lot like a wheel and you're just like a spoke on that wheel. And there's a lot of people across this wheel that are actually going to need you and can be connected with you. Um, and that's where I think, you know, the same thing, like we talked about with free work, know what you want to get out of an exchange, but like be very tactical with who you want to connect with just because they're not in your target audience and just because they may not be, you know, a new client tomorrow or maybe ever doesn't mean that they're not going to add benefit. Um, I think a, a good friend of mine has a quote. I think it's his, um, you know, treat everybody like they could get you on the cover of Forbes. And at the heart of it, it, it's true whenever you network as well, that I can meet somebody on LinkedIn tomorrow who doesn't look like a fit at all for what I do or how I do it. 
may not even be close to who I even would talk to in real life. But, you know, starting that connection and being friendly and like open-ended, seeing how you can help them and how you can help one another could definitely pay off in the long run. And I think that's where we can get, I think all of LinkedIn, all of social media, all of this personal branding stuff, like we can back off the wagon of like target audience is important for your business, but let's not overestimate the fact that, you know, the random guy on the street um, could actually help you a ton if you gave them, you know, gave them a chance and actually spoke with them. And I think that's where, you know, anyone who you meet or anyone you help, you're going to be able to bring value to in some unique way. You just have to be open-minded to that and understand that it doesn't happen overnight. You know, all the the little calls or networking things you do are just messaging people on LinkedIn. Not all of it's going to attribute to revenue the next day. Um, but yeah, give, give it some time, give it some hope. I mean, this stuff doesn't happen overnight, but it's nice to know that as you build those relationships and build those connections over time, you actually see the payoff from it. I love how you said the connection doesn't bring revenue the next day. And I think people that don't understand that, they take social media the wrong way because then they're only posting to sell, right? They're not posting to kind of build an audience that would curate maybe revenue down the line, but ultimately they're there to serve. And if you're looking for revenue right away, you're not looking to serve. You're only looking to take. So when we officially met, technically, we connected on LinkedIn, but then you automatically just popped up and was like, hey, can I give you some free advice? To some people, they would be, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, like feel weird about that. I loved it. I was like, this is awesome. So... I want to understand kind of your thought process. We're going to get super technical here, maybe tactical with like LinkedIn. Do you do that with everybody? And like, why would you do that? And like, how would, what's like some advice when you're trying to connect with people? Recently, I've seen a lot of posts about people saying this isn't how to not connect, you know, maybe it's a weird message or whatever, but not only how do you connect, but how do you foster that relationship in the first few days once you've connected to them i want to know how you think of it yeah no i love that and you're you're honing in on the tactical sales process which i love um and i think when i i say sales everybody thinks oh you you think of that person as a lead like no not exactly i think of that person as somebody that i can help that you know if i can win them over they're going to be my best salesperson moving forward so if we're scrolling on linkedin and i'm going down i'm like oh, you know, this profile looks good. You know, they, they do something similar. Or maybe they don't do something similar, but, um, you know, let's check out their website. Ooh, you know, there's two or three things that I think I can do. You know, you are considered a lead in, in my books in the sense that I'm going to go, you know, shoot you an email and see if I can't give you some free value. And the reasoning behind that is because everybody runs around LinkedIn saying, hey, look, here's my services by now. And in every automated pitch is like, hey, please do this. Hey, do this for me. Hey, do this for me right now. You stick out like a sore thumb in a really good way whenever you offer to do someone something for someone else. So the whole point of us, you know, going out there, we do these quick five minute web audits. Um, honestly, you could probably charge twenty twenty five dollars for it, but it's the value of the fact that we're going out there, we're seeking someone out, and instead of them asking to do anything for us, like we're we're giving, we're serving directly off the bat. Um, and that's where it comes into the fact that like, hey, if I can prove to you that we're valuable in five minutes, maybe we can't bring value to you in a larger project. But you know, you know, you have a family member that was talking about a website and we just happened to land on your doorstep the other day. It's just, you know, random team out of nowhere that gave super valuable advice. And like that was only in five minutes. It kind of leaves you begging the question, okay, what does a full project actually look like with them? Um, but I mean, at the, at the end of the day, there's a phrase that I use with our sales guys. It's to educate and entertain. So basically like the term edutainment. Um, if you can make someone smarter and happier within the first five minutes of meeting them, the chances that you're actually going to close that deal go through the roof. And I think too many people just run around screaming, buy from me now and forget that if you can make someone smarter and happier, if you can make them a better version of themselves and make them laugh in the process, like, man, they're going to remember you days to come, weeks to come, years to come. And you're going to be top of mind whenever they actually need what you're selling or know someone that needs what they're selling. Um, you know, I think we, we can talk about it. And some people don't like that process because they're like, oh, like you're just hoping someone refers you. Well, yeah, that's how you run the business. But at the same time, like for us as an example, like, cool, like I see that value. Now we're, you know, hopping on a podcast. We're going to get to stay in touch. Like now that opened up a whole new relationship and friendship comes from a simple cold email that offers some value. So I think a lot of us are afraid to do that human to human interaction, the the nitty gritty of like, hey, am I going to get behind a computer and make you a quick five minute video? 
you know, that stuff doesn't scale, but some of the best marketing tactics can't be tracked and can't be scalable. Sometimes you do have to get down and dirty and actually do some of the hard work to stand out. The more interviews with people I do, I find that people with big followings still love those small, intimate conversations and connections. The people looking to foster a great community around their brand care about the individual. For David, he has gone through a few shifts in his business since he first started. I wanted to learn how he found his target audience. Yeah, I definitely, the first year or so, even two years, I did it completely wrong. I went after your pure titles, which everyone, you know, if you go on a website, like a, a typical SaaS website, like, oh, we help VP of sales close more deals. Oh, so like that SaaS website must be targeting titles. Maybe I need to target titles too. And there's some sentiment in that and some understanding that, you know, you do have to probably target titles because they're pretty similar across the board. But like underneath that, I think a lot of people target titles because a lot of those titles bring to light very similar issues. VP of sales across the board probably struggle with the same things. It's easier to group them as VP of sales, right? But the stuff that I have started doing recently, I call it the Tim Ferriss model. Um, you go after attributes and characteristics. You don't go after titles. So Tim Ferriss, you know, his podcast, really well known, right? He didn't go after the best financial coaches. He didn't go after the best business consultants. He went after the best of each of those categories and focused on the characteristics and tactics that the top 1% of coaches, consultants, you name it, are going to share. And in the same way, you know, I stopped going after titles six to eight months ago and started going after the raw characteristics of like, you know, who am I actually targeting, but explain it in a way that I don't use a single title or any identifiable characteristic on LinkedIn. Like I can't search up what I'm actually targeting for on LinkedIn. And a lot of that comes down to like, one, it gets me away from just looking at a target audience as a list of data and statistics, because, you know, your target audience isn't 20 to 25 to 34 year old males in Indiana. It's, you know, someone named Zach who does X, Y, and Z. And I think that's where we forget that, you know, we try and turn in this target audience to a list of data points. It's really hard to market to a list of data points on an Excel sheet. I don't know how to do, no one knows how to do that, but it's a lot easier to, you know, market to Zach and Amy who, you know, you can embody what you actually want to go after. And that's where I just started looking at like, you know, marketing is a lot of psychology and it's understanding how people work and why people buy. Um, so I think in developing that target audience to really, I guess, keep it high level and understanding it's that, you know, go after the things that your target audience and groups of target audience are going to struggle with. For us, like, you know, our tagline is developing websites that develop your business. We're going after the people that know marketing is important, but don't really know the next steps. They know this is going to be an engine to actually help their business grow, but don't really know what to do. They need someone with that strategy, that that consultant feel that can come and be like, do exactly this. And this is what's going to happen. And let's be there for you. But it's not like I'm, I'm going up and typing in, you know, VP of sales to LinkedIn and, and targeting them. Right. Um, I, but I do think, you know, VP of sales and, you know, directors of marketing and, uh, people on client success are all going to ask that same question of like, Hey, I know our website's important, but I don't know what to do about it. I've heard it, uh, called like psychographics. So basically how they see the world, believe the world. And I've started to focus a lot more on that as well, because if you just have a name, you could miss out like a demographic, let's say like from 30 to 40. But there's a 55 year old who sees the world and understands social media in a good way and they want to trust you and do it. That's awesome. But if I was like, oh, sorry, you're out of my demographic, doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't work. I, I've heard the term psychographics. I, I don't use it. I like the Tim Ferriss model, but uh, I perfect sense. It's, it's a lot easier to target how you see world versus these data points that don't always correlate with how people see the world. Um, like we landed a client, I think two guys are older, 60 plus, and I guess two or three guys, 60 plus. And one of them was just like, yeah, can I Venmo you? I was just like, I love it because that's like something a 25 year old would say. Uh, and I think it's just, it's going after and targeting like these qualities and people that are across the board, people that I can get along with as well, because, you know, I don't, I don't even know where a checkbook is. I don't really want to deal with that. But like, I, I know what Venmo is like, of course I can get along with you. That's how you see the world. You see it with ease. So, um, I think any, I mean, top to bottom, whether you're starting entrepreneur or you're running a, a larger company, like understand that people are much more than just the data points that are associated with them. How does discipline and consistency play a part in building an audience, especially in the beginning? Yeah. Um, 
a fantastic question. One of my favorite to talk on. So if you talk about, like, let's say leadership, you know, and you want to become a better leader, you don't become a better leader by um, going at it in spurts. You know, no one became a top notch leader because they went to some weekend conference where they had 18 seminars and there were 30 hours of lessons and like, wow, like I did everything at once and now I'm a better leader. Like no one wins like that. People win by going at it day by day by day by day. And the consistency and all that stuff is boring, which is why we like going to those weekend conferences because they seem fun. Um, but that consistency and being bored with the right steps, you don't want to be bored by doing the wrong stuff. But, you know, diving into the fact that like if I can get 1% better every day, that's super boring. That's not flashy. That's not going to land me in Forbes tomorrow. But if I do it right in 15 years, that's going to land me in Forbes every other week because I've built up a consistent effort to make it there. And I think a lot of people see like from, I guess, point A to point B, they're like, okay, I need to shoot straight to that. They forget that like 80% of that graph is towards the bottom. And then it starts to become exponential and you really shoot up to the top. Um, and there's a, an author that I love, I swear by this book, James Clear, Atomic Habits. He talks about like the 1% rule. You get 1% better every day. It's boring. Consistency is boring. Su success to an extent is boring as long as you know what you're doing and you're doing it the right way. Uh, and I've d I definitely, you know, really honed in on that and accepted the fact that like I wake up every morning, my vision is clear. I'm going to improve the business and myself by 1% today at minimum. And if I do that enough times, over the course of a year and 12 months later, what I was the year before should be completely unrecognizable. James Clear just tweeted two days ago, I think. He said if pretty much anybody, 75% of people, picked one skill and did it every day for two years, they would probably become top 10% in that skill level, whatever, uh, in the world. And he's like, but there's no one that has the attention to do something every day for two years. And that's everything right there in a tweet. There's a great book. And I guess for those of you listening as well, it's the book is called The Shallows. It's about how the internet has changed the way our brains work. And the whole premise is like, you know, it, it's great for a marketer to understand about how our brains actually retain information. But the whole challenging thing is like, look, like 20 years ago, we could do stuff for more than 20 minutes. Now it's impossible to watch like a full grown man or woman sit down for more than five minutes and not fidget or not do something. Great. Like we are so tightly wound today. Um, and I think it's the same thing. Like if we had the attention and discipline to not have the shiny object syndrome and go after everything that catches our attention and just hone in on one thing for two years, like you'll, you'll get to a point to where you are really, really good at something. And there's a potential that that brings in really, really good money for you. But no one wants to put in the two years prior to that because it seems boring. It's a lot easier to go, sh you know, start a new Shopify floor and then, you know, the, the week later, go stop another Shopify store and try and launch that and, you know, jump back and forth. If we could hone all that attention down to one thing, uh, the world would be a different place because all of us are taking action. But I'm sure a lot of businesses would be in a better place, too. Mine included because I'm guilty of it. I'm, I'm, I'm not a perfect standard by that by any means. I struggle a lot to keep, you know, that focus going. Um, but I, I think if all of us could get a little bit better with that every single day, we'd be in a lot better place. How does a website help you build an audience? The same, I'll, I'll throw a question back at you, potentially rhetorical. How does owning a house help you throw a party? Like you get to direct all the traffic there. You own the setting, you own the venue. You can do whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want to do it. Um, you know, you own that whole lot. You can build a bunk bed inside. You can throw parties. You can put a pull out back. You can do whatever you want to actually engage the people that you want to come to your party. You know, a website's not much different. In the world of, you know, there are 30,000 things online, especially social media, the power of a website is really, 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 you know, underestimated. People don't see the full benefit in owning that, you know, digital real estate. And I think as we look at it, like, how does a website actually help you develop a business, make a bigger impact? Well, at the end of the day, like you own everything there. So if you want to do something special on your website that your competitors don't have, like, Awesome. Instagram's not in the way to keep you from doing that. You can like freely go make those changes. And I think it really opens up the playing field to not only brand yourself as that, you know, unique competitor in the market, but also for you to really, you know, how can you better serve your target audience? There aren't any limitations here. Like let's actually think big. Um, so I, at the same rate, you know, a lot of it is a give and take. It's a two-way street with your target audience, right? But 
you know, if I'm running like a, a client services business, which I know really, really well, you know, how can our websites be super specific to them and actually serve them and not be just like an Instagram page? Because truthfully, there's a lot of websites out there that are just like, you know, I could read your Instagram and get the same information. It's just like a bunch of information rearranged on a website. But like the really good ones are like, okay, here's a resource page. Let's dive into this. And like this page should be your book on how to build a business. Um, you know, here's a, a grouping of webinars and podcasts that our team's been on. This is where you can continue to learn. Like these are funny videos from the past or these are really good videos from the past. So I think uh, the short answer is that you own that. Like if I wanted to throw a party, it's really hard to throw a party if I don't own a house and invite people in and have nowhere to really direct people to. I can send out a bunch of flyers, which is what social media would be the congruent to you know, build a lot of attention, get a lot of demand going, get people excited. But if I don't have a place to send them to, all of it fizzles out. So I think a, a website in two parts, one, it, it catches all that audience and it doesn't result in wasted energy. But two, like you get to own it. You get to have fun. Like if you want to put a pool in the backyard, pull, put a pool in the backyard, like have some fun with it, play around with it. Enjoy the fact that there's a lot of freedom that it grants you, but also know that like you also have the freedom that if you know something drives revenue, you know, you can do that a thousand times over until there's a new strategy that does it even better. I finish off the podcast with a segment called Open Mic. This is a chance for my guests to share anything they want. A lot of times, I feel like people get stuck behind the industry that they are in, but we are all human and have other interests outside of that. So this is a space for my guests to say whatever they want to say. Well, first off, thank you for having me on. Uh, I won't go long. I don't know if this is on brand or off brand for the people that know me, but there's a... Uh, and I'm kind of thinking about it now. Back whenever I was younger, we used to vacation in Gatlinburg, Tennessee every year, uh, especially for my brother's birthday. And on, on the main strip there, I haven't been in a while, there's like this giant ball that it's, there's water underneath it. But the thing is, everybody will try and stop this ball. And to get it rolling again and moving again is extremely difficult. But once you get it moving, you know, it, it can do its thing for minutes at a time. And then it, it needs minimal effort to keep going. The analogy I always have drawn from that, especially now, is that you know, as we're starting out something new, the very beginning of that phase is always going to be difficult, whether it's a business, whether you're just trying to start a new habit of working out every day, it's going to be hard. But the thing is, you know, the more that you can get past that initial hump and the more that you can figure out like, hey, this is supposed to be hard at the beginning. I need to build some momentum and actually keep this stuff going in the long run, the better it will be. And I, I think that's where if everybody could just pick one thing, do it for a month and see what happens. I think we'd be in a lot different position, whether it's a business or not. But like if three years ago, two years ago, if I could go talk to myself at the beginning, you know, cut off 90% of the things you're doing, focus on one thing and see what happens. Um, so, so the unbranded or branded, I guess, uh, free mic is just, you know, understand that momentum is super important. Like it's, it's harder to get the ball rolling than it is to keep the ball rolling. And the more that you can focus and build on the momentum that you do um, and the momentum that you actually generate, the better off you'll be in the long run. My key takeaway from this conversation is how you can craft an incredible online experience for people that will build an audience. A lot of times it is easy to think about social media where the audience is built, but where you keep your audience is important and a website is where you need to move them before a social media platform is gone. I also love how David sees how to connect with people and how he can genuinely give them value to build up their brand and business. You can follow David on LinkedIn and Twitter and visit Numa Media's website at www.numamediallc.com. All of the links to find David will be in the show notes. Thank you, David, for being on the show. If you like this show, tweet me at Matthew Gatozzi. And if you really love this show, drop a rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcast listening app, and I will talk to you next week.